Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Samwick, and I'm the director of the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center at Dartmouth College. The Rockefeller Center aspires to educate, train, and inspire the next generation of public policy leaders. And we do that today by hosting one of the current generation's most promising and most important public policy leaders. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture by Melanie Sloan on the very important question of, can the government be trusted to oversee itself? If the answer to that title question is yes, I'll be very surprised. And our guest today might be out of a job. Ms. Sloan is the Executive Director of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, also known as CRU. I don't fancy myself an expert on grassroots movements or citizen government, but it does seem to me that at the core of any successful mobilization is the basic proposition that the first person to stand up for a principle makes it easier for the second person to stand up for that principle as well. And both of them make it easier for the third person and all subsequent people to stand up for that principle as well. So as a society, we should value people who take the lead in standing up for their principles. And it is in this respect that CRU and its executive director excel. Since 2003, CRU has closely monitored government ethics, bringing egregious conduct to light and holding public officials accountable for their misconduct. You can go to CRU's website at any time and find an updated list of the 15 most corrupt members of Congress, with links to extensive investigations of their ethical violations. CRU's team of lawyers puts as much pressure as our judicial system allows on elected fish officials who do not faithfully execute the duties of their office to shape up or ship out. We are fortunate to have one of our nation's most effective prosecutors of good government with us today. Ms. Sloan is someone who knows Washington from the inside out. Prior to starting CRU, she served as an assistant United States attorney in the District of Columbia from 1998 to 2003. Before becoming a prosecutor, she served as minority counsel for the House Judiciary Committee working on criminal justice issues for then-ranking member John Conyers. Ms. Sloan also served as counsel for the Crime Subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee, chaired by then-Representative Charles Schumer. There, she drafted portions of the 1994 Crime Bill, including the Violence Against Women Act. In 1993, she served as nominations counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee under then-Chairman Joseph Biden. Prior to working for Congress, she was an associate at Howry and Simon in Washington, D.C. She received her B.A. and J.D. from the University of Chicago. Her legal scholarship has been widely published, and she is frequently called upon by national news programs and media outlets for, ana for analysis and commentary. Her talents and hard work have not gone unnoticed. In 2006, Rolling Stone named her one of the year's greatest mavericks. She has been named one of Washington's top grassroots lobbyists by The Hill for three years running, and she was profiled in the September 2009 issue of O Magazine as part of the O Power List, which I'm not embarrassed to say is how she first came to my attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ms. Melanie Sloan. Okay, yeah, I'm on, okay. Well, of course the answer is no. You can't trust the government to monitor itself, and our founding fathers didn't think so either. That's why they set up three co-equal branches of government, and what's also called often the fourth estate, the, the press. So even now, even with all of that, it's still up to you and me, the citizens of the country, to really keep an eye on things. And for those who think we're not up to the task, I want to share my very favorite parable with you. A little girl is walking along the beach, and she sees a lot of starfish. And she starts picking them up and throwing them back into the water. And her mother says, don't bother, dear. It won't make a difference. And the little girl looks at the starfish in her hand, and she says, well, it'll make a difference to this starfish. Well, the starfish story is really Crew's story. With only one employee, me, Crew opened its doors in 2003 based on the premise that we could effectively use the legal system to target unethical conduct by the administration and Congress. Conservative groups, such as Judicial Watch, successfully applied this tactic throughout the 1990s, convincing much of the public that the Clinton administration was, was unethical. <clears throat> Before Crew, however, no organization used the same sort of tactics across the board. 
But rather than focusing on personal peccadilloes, although sometimes we have to focus on personal peccadilloes, uh, we concentrate on the serious malfeasance. Crew's mission is to demonstrate to the public that there are some who sacrifice the public good to special interests and that they're well paid to do so. Our method for advancing this goal is threefold. First, we decide what unethical or illegal conduct we want to highlight. Next, we consider what the appropriate legal action will be, whether it's a Department of Justice complaint, a Freedom of Information Act request, a complaint to the Federal Election Commission, or an IRS complaint. And then, because legal stories provide a hook to the media, we market our work extensively to media around the country. This works because voters care about ethics. National exit polls following the 2006 midterm showed that 42% of voters called corruption an extremely important issue in their choices at the polls, ahead of terrorism, the economy, and even the war in Iraq. And let me give you some examples of our work. The thing I'm most proud of, and that I will go to my grave saying that if I never did anything else, I did this, was uh, Cruz's work on former Majority Leader Tom DeLay. In 2003, when I first began approaching Democratic leaders about going after DeLay, I was told he was untouchable. But I was convinced that he was one of the most corrupt members to ever walk through the halls of Congress. And I wrote the complaint that was eventually filed against him with the House Ethics Committee by former Representative Chris Bell. This complaint, by the way, broke a 10-year ethics truce, whereby both parties had agreed not to file complaints against the other. As a result, DeLay was admonished by a unanimous ethics committee. In our continuing efforts to turn delay into a poster child for a corrupt Congress, we began working with the media on stories about delay's other unethical conduct, stories about his connections to Jack Abramoff, about his privately funded travel, about the fact that his wife and daughter were paid millions of dollars, and the fact that his foundation was largely funded by corporations seeking his legislative assistance. As a result of all of the scandal surrounding delay, polls showed he wouldn't win his election and he decided to retire. Cruz's incessant attacks helped bring down one of Washington's most powerful politicians. In addition, as a direct result of the delay complaint, an ethics beat was created, with over 80 reporters focused on primarily on ethics. Now, not a day goes by when you can't read some story somewhere about government ethics. This increased attention <clears throat> to ethics is largely a, an eff, um, a result of our work. Each week, we field dozens of calls requesting analysis of congressional ethics issues from reporters from major news associations, uh, including the Associated Press, the Washington Post, the New York Times, CNN, National Public Radio. Intent on convincing the public that Congress had been overtaken by a culture of corruption, and it wasn't just about Tom DeLay, Crew began widening its focus. This may be a little far back for some of you, but Crew prepared ethics complaints against both Randy Duke Cunningham and Representative Bob Ney both of whom eventually went to jail. From the first day, we read about Cunningham, who chaired the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, and we learned that he'd sold his house to a defense contractor for a price above the home's asking price, above the home's value. Crew had been publicly proclaiming that Cunningham had been accepting bribes. It seems obvious now, after later we learned about his bribe menu and his penchant for Persian rugs and French furniture, but at the time, no one besides Crew was calling it bribery. There have been a string of other politicians who we focused efforts on. Rick Santorum, Pennsylvania Senator, uh, Senator Conrad Burns, former Representative Kurt Weldon, former Representative Jim Sweeney, former Dartmouth alum Don Sherwood, all, by the way, now gone. Most recently, we had a lot of time focused on Nevada Senator John Ensign. As you may remember, John Ensign confessed to an affair with his campaign staffer, Cynthia Hampton, who was married to his chief of staff, Doug Hampton. His parents then gave Ms. Hampton and her family a $96,000 gift after he fired both, uh, after Ensign fired both the Hamptons. Later, it came out that Mr. Ha Senator Ensign had also helped Mr. Hampton obtain a lobbying job and had been soliciting clients for Mr. Hampton and had then been meeting with those clients on Doug Hampton's instigation. Well, Crew filed complaints with the Department of Justice, the Federal Election Commission, and the Senate Ethics Committee. We allege Ensign had committed two crimes. He conspired with Doug Hampton to violate the one-year lobbying ban that applies to senior Senate staff. 
and that he had failed to disclose to the Federal Election Commission the $96,000 severance payment made to Ms. Hampton after her termination. In the letter to the Ethics Committee, we also alleged that Senator Ensign had engaged in sexual harassment by firing Doug Hampton because his affair with Cynthia Hampton had ended. We aggressively worked with the mainstream media, and as well as Nevada media, and the online community. It's really important for crew to work not just with the Washington Post and the New York Times, but also if we're working on issues regarding a particular senator or member, we want to talk to their hometown paper and their drive time radio, because that's often what most of the members' constituents are actually reading and hearing. Just last week, Indiana Congressman Steve Bluyer announced his retirement from the House following Crew's complaint to the House Office of Congressional Ethics and the IRS about a, a charity that Bluyer had founded called the Frontier Foundation. This foundation was allegedly started to give um, scholarships to needy Indiana students. But in six years of existence, not a single Indiana student had ever received a dime, and yet Bluyer had flown around to luxurious golf courses around the country to play golf with uh, those lobbyists with business before him on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. He retired to spend more time with his family, particularly his um, sick wife, although he was talking about his sick wife and then announced that he wasn't and how sick she was and that's why he was retiring, but strangely he's not retiring for a year. There are others. Georgia's Nathan Deal used his position in Congress in an effort to intimidate the Republican Georgia Revenue Commissioner not to change a law that would have resulted in a loss of business for his salvaged car business. And Arkansas's Mike Ross, who sold his pharmacy for much more than its market value to a large pharmacy retailer that was very interested in his vote on health care reform. Although I'm most proud of our work on delay and certainly happy about all these others, I think we might be best known for our work in the Mark Foley scandal. I received the original Mark Foley emails, and these were the emails that he was sending to Teenage Page, who worked on the Hill. Um, <clears throat> and I sent them promptly, when I, read it, when I read them, I sent them promptly over to the FBI, because despite some descriptions of them as merely overly friendly, I believed in a rare case of agreement with conservative commentator Babe Buchanan, the emails had predators stamped all over them. When the story broke, it came out that the FBI had done absolutely nothing with the emails that we'd sent over. And the, at the same time, the FBI also said that uh, they'd been unable to do so because we had redacted all the important information so they couldn't figure anything out, uh, who was writing them. Now, first, they are the FBI, but secondly, we hadn't actually redacted anything. So we wrote a letter to the Department of Justice's Inspector General asking for an investigation. And then, in a scathing report a few months later, decrying the FBI's inaction when confronted with a potential sexual predator, the IG found that Crew had done the right thing when no one else had. And let me just say that we take on uh, unethical members regardless of party. We were just as hard on former Louisiana Representative William Jefferson, who was caught with $90,000 in his freezer and eventually convicted on bribery charges, as we were on Tom DeLay. Similarly, we've been very hard on John Murtha, the chairman of the Defense Appropriations Committee, um, who has uh, traded earmarks for campaign contributions for years. I mean, first we do this because we are a 501c3 organization. And so we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. But secondly, honesty and integrity are important values that we believe in and that we want our politicians to mirror. Crew summarizes our congressional work in a yearly report that used to be called Beyond Delay, but now that we're so way beyond delay, it's just called Crew's Most Corrupt List. The 2009 study included 15 members, 14 of whom are now under investigation by the Justice Department, the House or Senate Ethics Committee, or the Federal Election Commission. We put out a lot of other reports as well. For example, we put out one called Payday Lenders Pay Up, focused on how payday lenders went from making minimal campaign contributions to significant ones to key members of Congress to stave off federal regulation of their industry, as well as a recent report on the Senate's continued use of secret holds to prevent legislation and presidential nominees from coming up for a floor vote, despite the, House, despite the Senate having passed uh, legislation just two years ago allegedly ending the practice. Congressional corruption is just part of our portfolio. We devote a significant part of our resources to maintaining lawsuits under the Freedom of Information Act. The Freedom of Information Act is important for all of you to know about because it is intended to allow citizens to check on what the government is doing. As the Supreme Court once explained, the basic purpose of the FOIA is to ensure an informed citizenry 
vital to the functioning of a democratic society, needed to check against corruption and to hold the governors accountable to the governed. President Obama declared, a democracy requires accountability and accountability requires transparency. The FOIA encourages accountability through transparency. Using the FOIA, last year we won a case against the Department of Justice after the department refused to release the notes of Vice President Cheney's FBI interview over the leak of Valerie Plame Wilson's covert CIA identity. Under the Bush Justice Department, first they, the Justice Department under Bush first argued um, and then continued argue, making the same argument under Obama that uh, what we now call the Daily Show defense. They actually stood in court and told the judge that they shouldn't have to release these notes because they could be used to ridicule a government official on the Daily Show. John Stewart heard about that and noted that he actually didn't need us to help him ridicule a government officials on The Daily Show. Crew also challenged the Secret Service's refusal to turn over White House visitor records relating to meetings between top administration officials and Jack Abramoff and his minions, as well as Christian conservative leaders all under the Bush administration. The administration first argued that the records were presidential and not agency records and that they were therefore not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. <clears throat> After losing on that ground, the White House claimed they were presidential communications, but they lost there too. When the Obama administration came in, we broached settlement, but the Department of Justice refused. So we sued again, this time for records of visits by healthcare executives. And our suit just happened to be filed on the very same day as a presidential news conference on healthcare reform. And the president happened to be asked a question about why he was refusing to provide records of those visits when he was so in favor of transparency. Well, it didn't take too long for us to get a call from the White House counsel's office saying they were rethinking their position and they wanted to talk about settlement. So not only did they hand over the health care records, literally within two days, uh, they also agreed to, on a rolling basis, start posting all White House visitor records. Um, or nearly all. There are certain exceptions for national security and, and other things. But most White House visitor records are now posted online. Crew also brought the missing Bush emails to the, white, to the country's attention after we received a tip. It turned out that an estimated 14 million emails disappeared from White House servers for two years, from 2003 to 2005. <coughs> And that just happens to be a violation of federal law, which requires the preservation of all of those emails. We sued the Bush administration and were able to persuade the Obama administration to settle the matter by recovering at least some of the emails and installing a much stronger preservation system themselves. Although we won't ever know exactly what disappeared and why, at least some documents related to an important period in our nation's history, the beginning of the Iraq War, will be recovered for future generations. So what are we working on now? After seeing an email from the Veterans Affairs Department, um, a doctor there, Crew sued the agency to discover whether doctors have been diagnosing our returning veterans with adjustment disorder rather than post-traumatic stress disorder to save money. We've sued the Securities and Exchange Commission for documents that would allow outsiders to assess the effectiveness of the agency's reforms in face of its utter failure to pursue the many tips it received about Bernie Madoff. We have a case against the intensely secretive Federal Reserve to discover which banks have received loans from the Fed and what those banks are putting up as collateral. And we'll continue to file Freedom of Information Act requests with federal agencies and launch additional lawsuits all aimed at highlighting ethics abuses and problems at federal agencies. When we can, we try to work with the administration. <coughs> We're working with them now on important reforms to, regarding federal record keeping, government transparency, and making sure the Freedom of Information Act works as intended. We'll hold the Obama administration to its promise to be more ethical and transparent. We were highly critical, for example, of the um, administration's uh, decision to support Tom Daschle for the position of Secretary of Health and Human Services when we learned that Mr. Tash Daschle had failed to pay taxes for a limo and driver. And while we applauded the executive order promising not to appoint lobbyists, we criticized the liberal use of waivers allowing the administration to appoint lobbyists after all. At Crew, we thought a ban on all lobbyists was overbroad when announced, but then were stunned when very quickly an exception was made for William Lynn at defense. I've heard the argument that William Lynn was the only qualified person for his job of deputy secretary of defense. 
that's really hard to swallow. I mean, there was more than one qualified person to be president of the United States. So what is William Lynn, the Department of Defense's soulmate? He used to work at Raytheon as a lobbyist for Raytheon. So it seemed kind of a hard fit to put, to say you're not going to hire any more lobbyists and then take a Raytheon lobbyist and put them over at the Defense Department. At the same time they were putting in this Raytheon lobbyist, the administration has refused to take any nonprofit lobbyists and put them to work in the administration. <coughs> the fact is nonprofit lobby lobbyists, folks who work diligently on issues related to the environment, consumer affairs, civil rights, health care, and other important issues, many of them couldn't have worked in the Bush administration. So they joined nonprofits in an effort to push the government to do better. And that was an admirable choice, and those are people we should want in government. But no, those people can't have jobs, and so we've been critical about that. <coughs> and this ban has had some negative effects on nonprofit organizations. First, folks no longer want to lobby for nonprofits for fear of losing later opportunities to work in the administration. Second, and this is a problem across the board, not just with nonprofits, we're seeing a huge deregistration um, uh, effort in Washington where people who have been registered as lobbyists in the past are deregistering. So we're actually seeing less transparency, not more. But in any case, if the administration wants to boast about its changes, it's going to have to live with them. Broad pronouncements of policy followed by highly technical rationalizations are just the sort of thing that make Americans rightfully skeptical of our government and are the kind of thing that groups like crew and citizens need to keep track of. The administration was shocked by all the bad press they received after announcing the waiver policy and promptly giving waivers, and now they pretty much don't do them anymore. But if you've been listening to Obama, just for example, again, at the State of the Union, you know that he's willing to blame lobbyists for pretty much all of Washington's ills. But the issue is really not that simple. And this is a place where you really need to watch closely to see if politicians' actions are living up to their promises. There are good and bad lobbyists, like there are good and bad members of Congress, and there are good and bad everything else. <clears throat> lobbyists, a good lobbyist can help educate Congress and the administration on critical and sometimes highly technical issues. When the administration banned all lobbyists from communicating with administration officials for stimulus funding, it was really a case of the emperor having no clothes. This memo was designed to placate the American people's concern that Recovery Act money was being spent on private interests and not the public interests, but in reality, it wasn't fixing the problem. Banning lobbyists from speaking with administration officials didn't guarantee that no improper influence or pressure would actually drive the distribution of funds. A registered lobbyist couldn't have a meeting with a government official, but bank presidents, corporate directors, business executives, and others, many of whom had contributed handsomely to the administration and to the campaigns of key members of Congress, still had access. <clears throat> These people just became de facto lobbyists, albeit lobbyists who didn't have the same rigorous disclosure requirements that registered lobbyists do. The Wall Street Journal confirmed that that was exactly what was happening explaining how lobbyists were sending company executives and, uh, <coughs> executives and lawyers or consultants to meet with federal officials. A lobbyist at one firm explained it was just easier for him to hand off the stimulus money lobbying to people who weren't registered. One lobbyist explained that since he couldn't attend meetings himself, he brought local officials to Washington, briefed them, provided them with a list of questions, drove them, drove them to the meetings, and then explained what the government officials' answers meant. And when these non-lobbyist meetings, non-lobbyists meet with federal officials, those meetings aren't disclosed. So, for example, during the week of April 20th, the Energy Department, which is distributing over $40 billion in stimulus money, disclosed only two lobbying contacts over the course of the week. Clearly, meetings were taking place, we just weren't hearing about them. <coughs> Crew was also concerned that members of Congress still had influence over how money would be spent. In early March, there were front page stories about California Representative Maxine Waters arranging for a meeting between Treasury, Bank official, Treasury Department officials and representatives of One United Bank, a bank in which her husband has a financial interest. One United got $12 million. The March 20th memo that the President had put out on this clearly didn't ban any contacts by members of Congress, even pushing issues for which they might have their own financial interest. And this was certainly an, uh, an instance in which there was undue influence, which was inconsistent with the administration's goal of avoiding improper pressure. And this is the kind of thing you have to be vigilant to call them on. 
Well, Crew worked with the ACLU, and in one of those, again, rare moments, I called up the American League of Lobbyists and said, I'm here to help you, which is not really what they expect when I call. <clears throat> And we work together to advocate that the administration disclose all contacts with lobbyists, corporate executives, and others. The White House wouldn't go along with that. They thought it was too burdensome, but nevertheless, the rule was changed. At the end of the day, they changed the rule to bar not just lobbyists, but everyone from speaking with agency officials when competitive grants applications had been filed. And so this wasn't a perfect rule. It's not what I would have ad one I was advocating for, but at least it was a more reasonable change. How has it all worked out? Well, at the end of August, the Associated Press reported the admi that administrative officials had reported still remarkably few lobbyist contacts since the Recovery Act had passed, and agencies were reporting 197 contacts with lobbyists about stimulus grants. The Education Department listed only 19 meetings, and the Departments of Homeland Security, State, and Veterans Affairs reported no meetings. Given all the money that's out there, it's hard to imagine no one's lobbying for it. Rather, it's likely the people who are lobbying are not registered as lobbyists. So query, what positive impact has any new lobbying restriction actually had here? The bottom line is the prohibition has encouraged participation by people who aren't required to register and abide by the rules set forth in stringent regulations that govern lobbyists, thereby actually decreasing transparency and accountability, exactly the opposite of what President Obama said he wanted to do. Again, so I want to go back to this issue, too, of the lobbyist deregistration. Before the new rules, the number of advocates who registered as lobbyists had been growing steadily, peaking in late 2007. <clears throat> a tally by the Center for Responsive Politics, a nonpartisan organization, counted at that point about 13,200. The number fell by nearly 200 by fall of 2008. The fall began shortly after Congress passed something called the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act, which imposed tougher reporting requirements on lobbyists, plus potential criminal penalties if lobbyists gave gifts or meal to law, meals to lawmakers who obviously can't control themselves from accepting gifts and meals. <clears throat> After the rules changed, private companies and nonprofit groups immediately began to rethink their registration. The New York Times reported that the Union of Concerned Scientists, for example, which advocates on arms control, energy policy, and environmental issues, had previously registered almost anyone who went to the Hill but once the law changed, thought the repercussions of registering were too high and deregistered everyone. Lobbyists were further motivated to deregister after Obama began enacting all his new limitations and all the new rhetoric against lobbyists. Many lobbyists say <coughs> the president's prohibition on hiring lobbyists and on lobbyists speaking uh, with administration officials motivated them to terminate their registrations and keep lobbying below the registration threshold, which is, by the way, 20%. If you spend 20% more than 20% of your time talking to members and staff on Capitol Hill, you have to register as a lobbyist. So now we're seeing a new kind of venture in Washington, a non-lobbying lobby shop. At the beginning of the year, a group called K Street Research was formed. Two newly deregistered de lobbyists rented space from their former lobbying firm and started a new business, engaging in research and public policy for the lobbying firm. They're now in the business of providing information to the corporate clients who hire the lobbyists for which they used to work. And this is probably just the beginning. As Obama keeps the drumbeat against lobbyists going, more and more will reconsider whether they really want to meet that 20% threshold. So what do I think we should do? Well, for real transparency, not just lobbyist contacts, but all contacts with private interests should be disclosed. Any and all communications between executive branch officials regarding particular projects, applicants, and applications for funding should be disclosed. The name and business affiliation of the person who contacts the government, as well as the name of the official contacted, the date of the contact, and the subject matter of the contact should also be disclosed. In this way, we could ensure that the administration could better meet its goal of what they call ensuring merit-based decision making. And we could do the same thing in Congress. There's no reason that congressional schedules couldn't be made public, and we should be allowed to see everybody that members meet with. The Honest Leadership and Open Government Act, which I referred to a little earlier, was passed in the uh, 110th Congress, and it was part of the fallout of the uh, Jack Abramoff scandal. This was how Congress was going to show the public that they were really reacting to all the scandals and they were going to fix the problems. Uh, they cut back on privately funded travel and banned all gifts from lobbyists. Well, you have to wonder, was all this really necessary? Keep in mind, everything that happened with Jack Abramoff was already against the rules. You couldn't take a privately funded trip to Scotland just to play golf before. 
You weren't allowed to eat at expensive restaurants. Members, weren't, members and staff couldn't eat at expensive restaurants and come up with thousands of tabs and thousands of dollars paid, by, paid for by lobbyists before. The House and Senate Ethics Committees, in, in my view, basically just serve as cover for the unethical conduct of their members. They allow Congress to say they're taking ethics seriously and that they have a process for dealing with unethical conduct while doing exactly nothing about that conduct. And if you think I'm wrong about that, consider not a single member of the House was even criticized uh, by, by the House or Senate. No, let me say that again. Not a single member was even criticized by the House or Senate Ethics Committee involved in the Jack Abramoff scandal, although many members were involved. What did the House Ethics Committee say about Duke Cunningham or William Jefferson? Exactly nothing. The investigation into Charlie Rangel has been going on for over a year and a half, and it's still unresolved. And it's unlikely that we will ever hear anything about the PMA earmarking scandal that has involved uh, Representative Murtha, Visklosky, and others. The Senate let former New Mexico Senator Pete Domenici off the hook for improperly contacting a sitting New Mexico U.S. attorney and pressing him to indict a Democrat to give the Republicans an edge in an upcoming election. <coughs> Senator Roland Burris lied to the Senate about the circumstances of his appointment to replace President Obama in the Senate, denying he'd ever discussed raising money for um, Governor Blagojevich in exchange for the appointment, and again, little happened. Former Alaska Senator Ted Stevens faced no consequences in the Senate after uh, strong evidence showed that he had um, <coughs> abused his office for private gain. In fact, the only incident the Senate Ethics Committee found unacceptable in recent time was former Idaho Senator Larry Craig's men's room fiasco. It seems that nothing gets the Senate Ethics Committee attention like gay sex. The House, recognizing at least a perception problem, if not willing to admit an actual enforcement problem, created the Office of Congressional Ethics. That office, however, has been largely stymied. First, unlike the House Ethics Committee, this one, the Office of Congressional Ethics, has no subpoena power, making it very difficult for them to get cooperation. Second, the Ethics Committee has removed jurisdiction from the Office of Congressional Ethics on several occasions or ignored the office's recommendations. Hostility between the two groups has become quite public, and just last week, the House Ethics Committee issued a report clearing a member that the Office of Congressional Ethics thought had engaged in wrongdoing and use the occasion to levy insults at the Office of Congressional Ethics. The Ethics Committee has made it perfectly clear it views the Office of Congressional Ethics as nothing more than an annoying interloper interfering with the uh, restrained and judicious process that the House Ethics Committee has going. But in, in my view, the House Ethics Committee would do well to remember that the reason OCE was created in the first place was because they weren't policing any conduct, any improper conduct themselves. And at least the OCE is trying to police misconduct, which is more than you can say for the House Ethics Committee now. <clears throat> Another issue is that many of the new penalties created in the 110th Congress in the wake of the Abramoff scandal were largely aimed at lobbyists and not members. It, uh, it was as if members could not stop themselves from accepting gifts, meals, and Caribbean travel. They're big on preaching personal responsibility, but they really just mean they can't resist temptation. One last issue I'd like to raise for you <coughs> is the recent Supreme Court case of Citizens United. Because this, too, is, um, is, is going to be impacting how Washington works a great deal in the coming months. In a 5-4 decision in Citizens United, the Supreme Court invalidated decades-old restrictions on corporations making what we call independent expenditures in federal campaigns meaning corporations and unions can now run advertisements uh, for advocating the election or defeat of any candidate for office. Anyone can run an ad anytime, any day. There used to be 30 and 60 day time limitations. Those are gone too. Justice Kennedy wrote for the majority saying that by suppressing corporate speech, the government prevents their voices and viewpoints from reaching the public and advising voters on which persons or entities are hostile to their interests. The court found for the very first time that corporations have the exact same First Amendment rights as individuals. And this overrules a previous decision called McConnell versus FEC in which the court had upheld regulations on political ads by corporations and unions. The court upheld some disclosure obligations, meaning that ads will have to carry disclaimers identifying the group or entity that paid for the ads uh, as well as who paid for them, uh, responsible for putting on the ads as well as the, who paid for them. 
From Crew's perspective, the most disingenuous part of the decision was Justice Kennedy's statement that these independent expenditures or the ability to create uh, finance and air ads doesn't lead to either corruption or the appearance of corruption, and that banning such expenditures is a violation of the corporation's First Amendment right to free speech. Justice Kennedy wrote, the appearance or influence of or acts, the appearance of influence or access will not cause the electorate to lose faith in our democracy. Ingratiation and access in any event are not corruption. Well, think about that. <clears throat> Notably, in a January 10th to 14th NBC Wall Street Journal poll, the public's congressional approval, uh, approval rating of Congress is a mere 21%. Despite Justice Kennedy's remarkably obtuse statement, the public perception is that special interests have greater access to and influence over our elected leaders. And this clearly diminishes our faith in our public institutions. Justice Kennedy's position is all the harder to understand given his decision in another case last year called Caperton versus Massey Cole, in which he wrote for the majority and found that a candidate for judicial office could be swayed to rule in favor of a contributor who had donated $3 million to his candidate to become elected to be judge and that he had to recuse himself from the case. So how is it judges could be influenced by, big, uh, by large amounts of money spent on their behalf, but members of Congress are not? Corruption and the appearance of corruption have been cornerstones of campaign finance law. If the court no longer believes that money corrupts, there will be no need to ban corporations from contributing directly to candidates, and we may well see the court eliminate this ban. There will also be no reason to maintain individual limits on how much money any person can contribute to a candidate. We may soon find ourselves with the congressman not from North Carolina, but from Bank of America, and the senator who used to be from Arkansas, but is now from Walmart. Stay tuned, though, because there are a number of cases going through the courts that will keep the state of campaign finance law in flux for some time. Similarly, similarly the House and Senate are hard at work trying to undo some of the damage uh, done by Citizens United. But again, I, I don't have a lot of hope for that because Republicans right now are, are all in favor of um, of the court's decision and John McCain, who was one of the leading proponents of campaign finance law uh, restrictions in the past, now that he finds himself with a tough election, is suddenly against any, any campaign finance law restrictions in the future. Thomas Jefferson said that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. A democratic form of government requires similar vigilance. You can't simply trust politicians, even the ones you like, to do the right thing all the time or tell you the whole truth, and I mean without any spin, all the time. The fact is, we get the government we deserve. If we don't pay attention, some of our leaders may make decisions that line their own pockets, or the pockets of their friends. Or they'll make decisions that are good for their own constituents, but not for the country as a whole. Or they'll tell us they're doing one thing, only for us later to discover we were oversold. But what Crew has taught me is that if we as Americans press forward and insist that our public officials be ethical, ask hard questions once they're in office without allowing ourselves to be palmed off with platitudes and flattery, and refuse to elect those people who don't live up to our ideals, we won't have a perfect corruption-free government, but we will have a more ethical and accountable government. So now I'm happy to take your questions. Yes. In your luncheon earlier, that you said that you actually didn't think that it would have as large a factor as people are saying, because isn't in the states that they're allowed to um, companies are allowed to contribute to elections? Haven't they not been doing that? Haven't they? You ha they haven't seen a lot of action um, actually because of shareholders not wanting to, um, or the company not wanting to get in trouble with shareholders or with the public that is buying their products. Well, I think there are definitely differing points of view on this. I think there is a large school of people who think that, like we were talking about early, that many corporations um, won't want to get more deeply involved because they have customers who are on both sides of the issue. But I think what companies are more likely to do, rather than putting their names on an ad and saying, you know, we're Coke and we support X, they'll give money to some other organization and they will create some other organization. Um, and now there's a whole new realm where you're going to see a lot more newly created organizations with great names, you know, like um, uh, Americans for America and, you know, <laughs> We Love Our Country. Again, like all these kind of names that will sound really patriotic. And you won't have ever heard of them before and you will have no idea what they are. But what they will be is really front, 
front organizations for other cor for corporate interests that don't want to be named but want to get a, somebody elected or somebody defeated. So, um, and, and some corporations, by the way, have already been doing this because there are some ways you've already, corporations have already been allowed to, um, uh, to donate to certain kinds of nonprofits. But I think you're going to see more of this. And in any event, I think the one thing that is a certitude is that we're going to start seeing a lot more uh, ads, a lot more ads right away. I mean, just last weekend, a new group was started, and I'm now forgetting its name, but it was started by Carl Rove and Haley Barber and uh, Jeb Bush. And so it's clearly a Republican organization. And it's starting a 501c3 and a c4. And it's basically said it's going to start uh, airing ads. So that was its entire purpose. Yes? Considering uh, this administration's talk of uh, transparency and accountability, uh, can you do a comparison with uh, regards to three or four administrations that? Uh, three or four administrations in the past concerning the culture and the climate in Washington right now, with regards to what the president has been saying right now? Um, I don't know if I'm good enough to be able to go back, say, four administrations. But I can tell you that the Bush administration uh, really prided itself on secrecy. I mean, it was, it's not, um, I don't think I'm attributing something to them that they wouldn't attribute to themselves. I mean, uh, as I'm sure you, I mean, pr Vice President Cheney believed in secrecy more than he believed in sort of any other given principle, and the American people didn't deserve to know what was going on. And um, I think in the, this, uh, in the run-up to this last presidential election, every candidate tried to say, well, because the American people really were tired of all the secrecy, and, uh, and I think rightfully so, and, and every candidate really, even uh, uh, John McCain as well as Barack Obama said, well, they would be much more transparent. And I think that Barack Obama came in and said, you know, transparency is a plank, and he has done some really important things. On, on his first day in office, he said, I'm going to make sure that we're going to, for example, respond to Freedom of Information Act requests, and we're going to have a policy of responding to those. When President Bush was in office, uh, John Ashcroft, had his uh, attorney general, had issued a memo saying, if agencies don't want to turn over information under the Freedom of Information Act, we're always going to defend them. So they had a presumption of non-disclosure. You agency don't want to return turn over anything for any reason. We'll defend you in your refusal to turn over material. So really, you had to be an organization like Crew under, to use the Freedom of Information Act because you needed to be able to sue. And, you, and suing is expensive. I mean, just to file the complaint is $350. Then you have to serve the complaint on everybody, and that's $50 a pop. And then you have to be lawyers or have lawyers who can write all the briefs for you. And President Obama came in, and Attorney General Holder issued a memo reversing that and saying, there's no presumption of non-disclosure. There's a presumption of disclosure, and we won't defend you if you, won't, if you, um, if you overly um, keep, keep information back. So I think that's really where we've seen um, a, a really big difference. Um, but that said, while I think President Obama has this view of transparency that is um, much improved, I don't think that's yet trickled down to all the agencies who are so used to this non-disclosure. And a lot of these people are just um, career government employees, and they're used to doing one thing in a, in a certain way. And um, it's hard to get that message down from the top. So we're still seeing a lot of problems with FOIAs not being responded to. And then we call the White House Counsel's Office, and then we can get our FOIA responded to many times. But in our view, that's not actual transparency. It's not useful if you have to be somebody like Crew to be able to contact the White House Counsel's Office to get an agency to respond to you. That's not true transparency. True transparency is when a regular citizen from Ohio or a blogger from North Carolina can submit the same Freedom of Information Act request and also get an answer. So I think um, while his heart seems to be in the right place, um, time will tell if he can really pull it off. Yes? Uh, could you lay out the case for making a more transparent Federal Reserve? Um, well, hmm, I bet you would be better <laughs> talking about this. But uh, one of the things I can say about the Federal Reserve that I think that they've been overly secretive about, for example, is who they're bailing out. I mean, it's with all of our money, uh, taxpayer money that is, was being used, that they were, they were using and they were handing out. And some of their rationale for not wanting to tell us, um, and we have a lawsuit about this, as does Bloomberg News, and, and so does Fox, in fact, um, that they don't want to tell us is because they said there would be runs on the bank. 
Well, in fact, we know actually some of the banks that have received um, federal funding and federal assistance, and there weren't runs on the bank. So the argument doesn't really hold true. So an argument that might have worked in the 1930s or something is, is really not true now. And I think the Federal Reserve is just used to being secretive, is used to not answering to anybody. Uh, they've also been resisting any kind of uh, further oversight by, uh, by Congress. And in some under, there's some reason to understand that, because a lot of people in Congress are not, as they say, as smart and educated on these kind of subjects as you'd like them to be if they're going to be regulating the Fed. But by the same token, I'm, I think that uh, there are real questions about the Fed has operated in the past. And uh, I don't think there's any um, agency or quasi-government agency that should be able to run all on its own without any oversight by anybody. Yes, in the hat. Um, I was wondering, with your guys, is that oversight of congressmen? Um, uh, when there's, um, I, know, I guess you obviously step in when there's some concrete evidence of, of misconduct or wrongdoing, but do you guys do anything or can you do anything when, for example, a congressman is um, accepting a large amount of money from a certain corporation or special interest group and then you know, their, vo their votes correlate heavily with, that group, with what that group wants um, to the harm of their constituents but without you know, any like, violations of, of spending laws or anything? Um, well, we do, and that was, for example, when we did this payday lenders pay up report. Um, this was a report that, again, was about uh, payday lenders who hadn't been giving money before were suddenly starting to contribute large amounts to members of Congress on key committees. And payday lending, <coughs> uh, payday lending particularly goes on around military bases, uh, and they charge usurious rates. And so Congress wasn't going to eliminate the ability to have uh, payday lending, but these people are also making v huge profits, and so and this issue has been regulated at some at the state level, but not federally. And so that's the kind of connection we make. Interesting, ex-congressmen who never before seemed to um, uh, be getting any money from payday lend lenders is suddenly getting X amount of money from payday lenders, and is noticeably talking against regulation of payday lenders. And so when we can find um, links like that, we we do make them, and and there are so many to be made. I mean, a couple of years ago, uh, there was um, hedge funds didn't used to actually contribute a lot of money. And then they started talking about um, uh, taxes that would particularly apply to hedge fund managers who, who really pay remarkably little, little taxes um, in many cases. And uh, as soon as they started, um, as soon as there was fear of regulation, the hedge fund managers, as you can imagine, started contributing massive amounts of money to Congress. I mean, they're very rich, so they had a lot of money to donate, and they spent it, and the legislation went away. Yes, right here. Yeah, um, you've talked about the shift towards. Sorry. You've talked about the shift towards uh, unofficial or unlicensed lobbying, and uh, you've made it clear that the president has a clear stance on this. He's encouraged uh, such legislation, and uh, also that McCain and the Republicans, at least in Congress, also have a clear stance. So I'm wondering, um, do you think that this the public stigma against lobbyists? Um, will perpetuate this system, or um, whether acts will become so egregious that it forces um, freedom of information um, acts and stuff like that? You know, um, it is uh, everyone's favorite boogeyman now in Washington is lobbyists. No, there is uh, only political points to be gained by bashing lobbyists, and so politicians do it routinely. Um, you interestingly will see it a little less by members of Congress who have to interact with lobbyists daily. And by the way, they're asking for lobbyists, they're asking lobbyists for money daily. I mean, there is no day that there aren't several fundraisers a day for many members of Congress, and the main people who attend those fundraisers are lobbyists. So you gotta be careful about how much you're gonna bash when you're also asking these people for money. Um, and some lobbyists will understand, well, you know, you hate me in public, but you love me in private. <laughs> Uh, I guess it's like you know having a girlfriend on the side, um, but uh, you know some lobbyists don't, and they say, you know what, you want to talk this, you want to talk smack about me this way. I'm not giving you any more money. So there are really some problems with this. Um, but on the other hand, lobbyists figure, okay, um, Obama wants to bash us, but we're laughing all the way to the bank because there is plenty of lobbying going on in Washington right now between things like health care reform and climate change, cap and trade. These these issues are complicated and have just legions of lobbyists. So lobbyists, on the one hand, don't really like all the being bashed so much, but on the other hand, they're figuring, OK, we're, we're making an awful lot of money. I guess we'll live with it. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, President Obama is really sticking with his anti-lobbyist rhetoric. Um, and we talk frequently with the White House Counsel's Office about how the rhetoric that the rhetoric you're, you're sharing is not met by your actions. Like, you are not fixing the problems you say you're fixing. 
But again, the public rarely delves that deeply. So he can just keep saying he's fixing the lobbying problem. He's changing the way business is being done in Washington when he's not. And he can say, I have these 10 new restrictions on lobbyists. And people will think, OK, you know, we all hate lobbyists now. Everybody hates lobbyists after Jack Abramoff. And we're, we're actually, he's telling us uh, I'm changing that, that he's changing this. And you know what? How many people outside of Washington actually know lobbyists? Nobody. So they're not actually really going to know in the rest of the country what's going on. Yes, in the back. How frequently um, does your work depend upon anonymous tips or tips from uh, insiders within an agency as uh, opposed to perhaps your own staff work? Um, sometimes we get tips. Um, we, like about the missing email, we were told by somebody who worked in the White House technology office um, about the missing email. And uh, initially, the White House denied that it was true. They, you know, Dana Perino, who's the White House spokesman, said it wasn't happening, and, and it was. Um, but for the most part, we do a lot of research. We go comb through campaign finance reports and financial disclosure reports of members of Congress. We also do a lot of reading on um, uh, national media and blogs. And if somebody suggests something about a congressman, we might go do a little more digging and see what else we can find about that person. Uh, and, and often, we can turn up something. Yes. Um, you know, it's always hard to say who's not corrupt because, you know, I, I can't, uh, I, I don't dig through somebody's entire campaign finance data to make sure there's no problem. Um, but Russ Feingold, for example, from Wisconsin has always been uh, particularly purist on all these kinds of issues. Um, and uh, he was a big campaign finance guy, and um, he tends to be very, very careful. Um, uh, so he's, uh, he's good. Um, I also think Jeff Flake from Arizona is very good. Jeff Flake is like the one member of Congress. He's a Republican who has just disavowed all earmarks, has said earmarks are corrupting from the, from the get-go, has said whether or not members are actually trading campaign contributions for earmarks. It certainly looks like they are. And of course, it doesn't just look like they are, they are. Um, but Flake says it has the appearance of corruption, and it makes people mistrustful. And there's so much waste, because you'll have things like a few years ago, we had the Teapot Museum. We needed a new appropriation for the Teapot Museum. I mean, they're just, and it's just anybody can go through and come up with a laundry list of ridiculous ideas. And, uh, and I think maybe it was Obama, but somebody else may have said this recently. I mean, everybody thinks an earmark is a waste until it's in your congressional district. And then you can defend it you know, to the nth degree. Um, and in, the problem is that these are people end up having very parochial interest. And this will be an earmark for you know, um, a bike path that you know, 20 people will use, and, but at a cost you know, of a few hundred thousand dollars to the American people. And this will help my district, so it's worth it. And they won't really think, they don't really look at it from a national perspective. Wow, we have such financial problems. Should we all be spending money on these kind of things? But the thing is, they'd all have to jump at once. They'd all have to agree to stop doing it. And uh, they're not ready to do that yet. Anybody else? Yes. Um, if congressmen aren't using earmarks, though, what do they have to show to their constituents? You know, at the end of the day, I feel like the congressman that I worked for, he had to show his citizens that he had, you know, gotten money for this park that they all loved. You know, how, I don't know how else are, I feel like a lot of times people are selfish and so in their districts they're not really going to care that um, the country, you know, this, the congressman did this for the country. They more care about what the congressman is doing for them. That's why usually I feel like their um, popularity is so high compared to Congress as a whole. Right, um, and I think you're, you're right about that. That's certainly part of the problem, and that's why members don't want to give up earmarks. But Jeff Flake keeps getting reelected, and he gets reelected because he's telling people, you know, he's try he goes around and talks to his constituent and tells them the truth about it. And everybody can see our budget deficit. So at some point, you'd think people would also appreciate the announcement by a congressman, you know, that I'm not going to be doing this anymore. You know, I I'm going to be very public about whatever earmarks there are. I'm going to only uh, consider things that are. Um, uh, that the government, for example, sometimes if some people have said uh, only ones that uh, state officials may be asking for, you know, and not just like the to renovate a theater downtown, which you get those kind of things. Or as I said, the um, there, I mean, there are often earmarks for 
Um, such some things that look so really trivial if you start looking them out on the whole. The other thing that I, I think is important is uh, it's amazing how many earmarks go in that actually um, congressmen don't want to tell anybody about. And it's one thing that you want to sell somebody, uh, your constituents, about what you did to a park. But what congressmen are more likely trying to keep quiet are the earmarks for um, the defense contractors who say aren't in their district. So let's say you're on a uh, significant committee, um, like the Defense Appropriations Committee. And let's say like you're John Murtha, who's one of my favorite targets for this because he earmarks more than anybody. So um, John Murtha is in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. But he will earmark for a defense contractor you know, wherever they are, as long as they give him enough money. So he doesn't necessarily advertise those earmarks on his website. And he's not alone. Many congressmen will trade earmarks for campaign contributions. And those earmarks are not even the earmarks that actually benefit their constituents but they benefit their campaign coffers. Yes? Can you say a bit about Cruz funding and, and what kinds of uh, folks, whether individuals or, or outfits, are interested in, in supporting your work? Um, yes, for the most part, um, rich people give us money who like what we do. Um, most of our donors are involved in the political process. Um, for a long time, um, I think that when we started, people gave us money because they thought uh, they really didn't like the Republican Congress, and we would help uh, help them take over the Democrats take over. And then uh, one of the first things uh, after the Democrats took control of Congress, and Nancy Pelosi was named Speaker of the House, one of the very first things she did was say that she wanted John Murtha to be the Majority Leader. We had already named John Murtha on our previous year's most corrupt list. And we blasted her. And of course, because we were considered to be a more progressive organization, that got an awful lot of media attention. Pelosi's first action blasted for naming um, Martha to be a majority leader. And um, <clears throat> I had a lot of donors call and scream at me. And I had a couple donors, including my biggest donor, drop, drop us cold and say they weren't going to fund us anymore because that wasn't what they funded us to do. And I said, you know, we're only doing what we were doing like two weeks ago. We didn't actually change anything we were doing. You're just paying a little more attention. We're, and uh, we're going to keep doing this because if I can't be honest about what we really think, then I don't need to do this job. And I can go do something else. Um, <clears throat> so we had sort of a um, meeting of the minds with donors who decided, there are donors who decided they wanted to stick with us because they believed in that, um, and then other donors who decided that they didn't. Um, but I think by, by now, uh, most of our donors really believe that honesty and integrity are important values like we do. We also get some money from some foundations, like the Carnegie Foundation. Um, and we get uh, donors on our website. And really, some of my favorite, like I have one guy who gives us like $2.36 like every couple of months. And you know it's just very nice because obviously he must be on a lower income, but he thinks it's important enough that he'll give us the two dollars and thirty six cents. So <laughs> I know his name and address. You know I, I write him thank you notes. <laughs> yes. So as someone not in this field, I, I can say that your Federal Reserve answer was was spot on. Okay, and, good. And you're right. They are. <laughs> a little too addicted to secrecy. I understand that there is this presumption that money is speech, and so that the money really can't be regulated. Well, not all money is speech. Some money is clearly bribery. And it seems like the desire to make an ad in whatever form is something that ought to be allowed. I don't see how you can have free speech, but say not that speech. But the giving of money directly to a candidate, that seems to be the source of corruption. Um, so for example, after I heard my first good story about lobbying, um, I thought it should be um, prescribed, forbidden to give money to someone who wouldn't represent you as a constituent. So it came up in the context of um, healthcare reform, where people from small states, population-wise, like Montana, had been given millions of dollars toward their re-election by people who were not citizens of Montana. And I would just like your opinion as to whether that's a sensible place to try to draw the line. Um, I think that might be a sensible place to draw the line. Um, I don't really agree with you, though, about um, 
the fact that uh, anybody should be able to run any ad and why should that be corrupting? Because let me, let me give you an example of how I think that will be corrupting. So let's say you're um, a member of Congress and you have a very tight election coming up. And you were planning on voting one way that is um, opposed to, say, pharma's interest. And pharma is a very powerful lobby with, a lot of, with an awful lot of money at its disposal. And they're willing to spend it you know, pretty easily. So let's just say that pharma comes in and says, I'm aware that you're planning to vote this way. You know, we're considering what kind of ads we're going to be running. And that member changes their vote because they are afraid that if pharma starts running those ads against them, they won't be, um, they won't be reelected. And I think there are members of Congress, I don't even think after a while anybody will need to make, I mean, if you were to make a, a very overt threat, you might have a legal problem. But I, as the person making the threat, but I think that you are ways to um, to voice those kinds of things. You know, where you just discussion-wise, you know, we're we're planning to spend money in these elections, and we're considering who we're going to support and who we're not, and what kind of ads we're going to run. And pretty soon, I think you'll have congressmen who will be so afraid to, um, who will just know that the threat is out there, and they will make decisions based on who has a lot of money and runs a lot of ads, like. You know, the Chamber of Commerce is willing to spend any amount of money, and they are. I mean, they've, Tom Donahue, the head of the Chamber of Commerce, is pretty clear, and he's already said that he's ecstatic about this new decision and can't wait to start spending it. Um, if you know that the, cha the Chamber of Commerce doesn't like a certain position, and you're in um, a, a very tight election, you may really rethink what you're, what you're going to do. Now, um, the question on um, whether uh, you could be um, limit uh, somebody over to just uh, giving money in their, in their districts. I, don't, I can see that there might be some constitutional issues with that. Because um, there have been issues in other cases about the issue of like burdening commerce and would that in some way burden commerce. But I think it's an interesting idea. There are laws in states, for example, and uh, that I particularly like, um, and this would be my own personal solution to Citizens United, is ban anybody who does business with the government from um, um, making an, an independent expenditure or ban anybody. I've always liked the idea of banning lobbyists from giving uh, money to anybody they're seeking, uh, seeking legislation or an earmark from. And then you're not actually banning, you're not banning the speech, you're not banning the money, you're saying make a choice. You can choose to either continue doing business with the government, you can choose to either continue lobbying, or you can make campaign contributions or make ads, but not both. And that would be um, something I, I would favor. That's been upheld uh, in a, a federal court in North Carolina when um, the ACLU sued over a restriction saying that lobbyists couldn't make campaign contributions to state legislators. Yes, in the back. All right. So. Got a question. So do you think a lot of these issues would be solved if there was greater national unity in the sense that um, if there was, let's see, we've got like a lot of deadlock in Washington right now and that's all caused in, in part by lobbying and in part by uh, senators and representatives trying to get as much money as they can for their own district and as many projects as they can from their own district. Do you think that would, um, do you think as a, a, an overall goal, do you think greater national unity would help put an end to some of these issues or not? I think if um, people did have less of an um, expectation that their congressman would bring home the bacon, and if we could all agree at once that that wasn't one of the things that made us admire a congressman or a senator, that that was not what we were looking for on how many buildings they could build in our district with their name on them, um, that would be, uh, I think, a good start. So at some point, given our financial uh, mess, we, we are going to need to start considering whether certain, um, certain expenditures are really in the national interest and not just whether they're in you know, this particular small district in Ohio or New Hampshire or, you know, or North Dakota, whether it's just in those people's interest. And you know, a good example of uh, a place where somebody actually went too far is Ben Nelson from North Dakota. Uh, Nebraska um, did some complicated he, to get his vote on health care. He had to the uh, everybody had to agree that Nebraska would have an entirely different formula for Medicare funding that they would get some benefit that every other state in the union wouldn't get. 
OK, well, at first he thinks he's just doing something for Nebraska. But pretty soon, this was a big embarrassment for the citizens of Nebraska who were saying, take it back. And the governor of Nebraska was saying, I don't want it. Um, and I think if we could have more instances like that where people are saying, you know what, we recognize this is bad for everybody else. Don't, don't give it to us. It's not, it's not that, it's not worth it. That'd be good. Did you, you had a yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so in light of this uh, campaign finance reform that we've been talking about for uh, commercials and stuff like that, um, I'm wondering, um, do you have any information or do you know anything about anybody being entrepreneurial in, um, in terms of buying up airtime? Um, it would strike me as we have a lot of firms with a lot of capital, uh, maybe even lobbying firms who would have an interest in buying up this airtime um, and then selling it to whoever um, has um, you know, political ideals or whatever in alignment with their own. Um, right. Yeah. Um, literally the day after Citizens United, there were meetings in law firms all across Washington about what they could do, what new business they could generate, should they create their own media buying firms, what should they be doing for their clients, and what should their corporate interests do. So I feel confident that some of those things are happening, although I'm not privy to the discussions as the reformer in the room. Um, but uh, I have heard that um, uh, big changes are afoot because everybody's sitting there thinking, how can we take advantage of this? What should we do now? And how fast can we act so we're the, we're the first people to take advantage of it? Okay, well, if that's it, thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate your time.